Hi, it's Dwyer. <clears throat> Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about the heavyweight division. It's May 21st, 2024. Let's talk about the heavyweight division now that Usyk has beaten Fury. Let me just warn people here, though. And I want to say this up front. Understand my agenda. This is not a fan club site. I'm not trying to ingratiate myself to the powers that be, nor am I trying to sell you on boxing, right? My agenda is just simple. It's to try to look at the unvarnished truth and to try to figure out how to get an edge on the casino for future fights. So while I have a lot of respect for a lot of the fighters I'm going to mention here, right? At the same time, we need to look at strengths and weaknesses, and we need to ask a foundational question. Is betting on this fighter or this fight worth it for me? Do I actually have an edge on the casino? If I don't, then I'm going to be eaten alive. So a viewer here asked me a great question. Who would I take? in the Usyk Fury rematch. And that's how it should be phrased because Usyk is now the heavyweight champion. Right? Let's give the winner top billing. Now, everything is odds dependent. I can sit here and say, hey, you know, I'm not sure if I touch this, but at the right odds, everything has a price. Here, though, assuming that the rematch is a 50-50 fight or close to it, right? Let's say they price it so that Usyk is the 55% favorite. I wouldn't touch the fight. Understand, I believe that either guy could have won the fight. I thought that Fury look like the better craftsman. And this is in a fight where I feel that Fury made some mistakes, right? You know, when he hurts Usyk, he should have leaned forward and tried to grab him, tried to remind him that he's the bigger man. He didn't do things like that. Also, I still don't get, and maybe it's an in-the-ring thing, I still don't get why people aren't trying to crowd Usyk on his right side. Right? Let me also say, too, the Usyk side of the ledger is a little concerning because Usyk did look vulnerable to the body. Right? Fury, before the collapse, starts landing right hands to the body. He's already landing left hands to the body. Let me point out, too, that if you want to see the best Tyson Fury there could possibly be, Look at Fury in the first six rounds of this fight when he's jabbing Usyk to the body. Right, folks? It's great stuff. Right? It tells you that Tyson Fury was not afraid of Usyk's high right hand. Let me also say a couple other things, too. <clears throat> you know, Usyk looked too predictable in this fight. He won the fight. He's the heavyweight champ, but he looked too predictable, right? It's that somewhat straight left hand that he relies on heavily. His right hand, too predictably for me, is too high up on a consistent basis. In other words, this isn't a Terrence Crawford performance where you're looking at a craftsman and the craftsman has a big toolkit with him. Right? No, this is Usyk targeting an opponent with specific shots where you're thinking, wow, you know, if Fury looks at the film, he's going to realize that Usyk, who was predictably front foot, 
right? There's no back foot moment where you're thinking, oh, wow, this is a wrinkle. Usyk's all plan A, right? The problem with the guy who's all plan A, think Mike Tyson, right? Front foot hooks. He's moving his upper body. Um, not a lot of jabs. The problem with the guy who's plan A is when that fastball loses a few miles per hour, the guy's stuff becomes hittable. In boxing, the guy becomes hittable. So, all praise to Usyk. He won this fight. But there were moments in this fight where it looked like Tyson Fury had taken over. Right? Fury showed enough where if this were priced evenly, I wouldn't touch the rematch. Don't get me wrong. The, e the rematch would be boxing at its best. I thought this fight was boxing at its best. Right? The rematch is certainly a must-watch. For me, though, it wouldn't be a must-bet because I don't think I have an edge on the casino for the rematch. I knew for this fight, Usyk off the opening line was undervalued. You knew that, right? For the rematch, I don't think I know enough. So just to understand, either guy could have won this fight. One guy did. That doesn't convince me that the result would be the same in a rematch. Let me also add a few other things too. Usyk is the better athlete. He was for this fight. He would be for future fights. His athleticism is sustainable because this is a guy who is always in great shape. Right? You don't see him and then suddenly think, oh my goodness, he's lost a lot of weight. You thought that here for Tyson Fury. In other words, Fury came into this fight looking lighter than he had for several fights, right? I'm not sure if that's sustainable, right? Fury's a guy whose physical condition goes up and down. There are many people wondering exactly how much did he train for the Francis Ngannou fight. I know Sugar Hill has given interviews and said, hey, we were ready for that fight. Sounds like a lot of narrative to me. Sounds like a lot of PR. Fury strikes me as a guy who varies in terms of his level of physical preparation. Usyk is always in great shape. Usyk always has great stamina. Right? You got the feeling that Fury deteriorated physically as this fight went on. Whereas Usyk continued to operate at the same level of energy and physical efficiency. Right? Understand, the guys who are always in shape have an advantage over guys who yo-yo in terms of physical condition, right? Tyson Fury now is living that, you know, hey, I've lost weight, I'm in shape, I took this fight seriously. That's going to be harder for him to sustain than Usyk sustaining his physical superiority and stamina, right? Just food for thought. When you're betting, you need to ask yourself, well, what are the variables? One of them here is Tyson Fury's physical condition, right? The flaws make the diamond. You know, Tyson Fury is great. One of the reasons he's great is his attitude toward life, right? You saw him here joking around in the fight and stuff like that. I'm sure that has helped his success. But what that also means is he's not as disciplined in general as an Alexander Usyk. Now, let me segue here. I think baseball people know this. I think baseball is the sport that really helps you understand boxing. Now, let's say about 15 years ago, in my opinion, 
the best pitcher in baseball was Greg Maddox. Right? Maddox was a guy who, on 3-2 counts, would throw change-ups. Right? This was a guy who had batters befuddled. They didn't know what was coming. You know, Maddox was the most dangerous type of pitcher possible. He was kind of like Terrence Crawford, where with Crawford, he's a different fighter every fight. With Greg Maddox, he wasn't a fastball pitcher. He really wasn't a curveball pitcher. What he was was the thinking man out there on the mound who was strategizing and beating batters. Right? And, of course, every edge he could get, he had. So he was a guy who, if he needed to throw a fastball, could. But he wasn't a fastball pitcher. He also was a guy who was one of the best fielding pitchers. So if you bunt it, if you hit a squibbler by him, Maddox was an underrated athlete. He'd get off the mound in the blink of an eye. He'd grab the ball. He'd throw you out at first. But for some reason, right, understand, just like we say in boxing, styles make fights, right? Styles also make hitter-batter matchups. For some reason, Tony Gwynn, the Hall of Famer, the batting champion, Tony Gwynn owned Greg Maddox. I'm not going to give you the stats. I want you to look them up. And we're not talking about a few at-bats. We're talking about Tony having a lot of at-bats against Greg Maddox and dominating him. If Greg Maddox, in my opinion, the best pitcher of his generation, was the only pitcher Tony Gwynn faced over a multi-year career, Tony Gwynn would have gotten in the Hall of Fame just off of what he did against Greg Maddox. Right? The matchups matter. Now, in boxing, we have a different mindset. And it's one baseball betters love, right? Because in boxing, there's a mythology where we rank contenders. So we'll look at a list and we'll say, oh, this guy's ranked lower than that guy. The higher-ranked guy should beat the lower-ranked guy. And understand, the casinos price the fights based on these public misperceptions. Right? No one wants to believe that there's a 10th-ranked guy out there who's a major threat to the champion. Right? We don't think of it like baseball people think of Tony Gwynn against Greg Maddox. Who cares where Gwynn's ranked? Right, Gwynn could have been a 230 hitter and owned Greg Maddox, right? Lord knows baseball is flooded with guys who aren't that great in terms of batting average who own the best pitchers out there, right? But in boxing, we believe in this ranking myth, right? Now, while rankings are important to figure out who deserves fights, Right? You say, well, who should be the mandatory? Right? You look at the ranking and you say, you know what? This guy was ranked number three before. He's beaten a couple of tough opponents. Let's make him the mandatory here. I don't believe rankings are good in terms of telling you who's actually going to win fights. Understand, the great Thomas Hearns lost twice to a Rand Barkley. The great Sugar Shane Mosley lost twice to Vernon Forrest professionally. I believe Forrest also beat him in the amateur ranks. So let's look at Usyk. Now, a viewer here told me that I was picking obscure opponents. <laughs> obscure opponents. Uh, to fight Usyk and wanted to know why I didn't pick Deontay Wilder, right? Let's answer that question head on here. Now, I believe Wilder is a Hall of Famer. I think Wilder is helped greatly by the fact that of all the opponents against Tyson Fury, apart from Usyk now, 
Deontay Wilder is the fighter who had the most classic moments. That 12th round of the first fight, my goodness. He knocks down Tyson Fury two times in that third fight. I know at the time, you know, Wilder was upset. Understand that Wilder Fury series of fights at heavyweight are the dominant heavyweight series of fights for this generation. Right? Both guys had big moments. Wilder knocks down Fury multiple times in multiple fights. Who else has done that? Right? Even here, Usyk wins this fight by an eyelash. He knocks down Fury once. And we're buzzing about it a couple of days later. Right? Well, understand, Wilder knocks him down twice. I think highly of Wilder. Wilder's fought, what, once in the last year or so? Didn't he lose that fight to Joe Parker? Wilder's now fighting Jili Zhang. Didn't Parker already fight Jili Zhang? Didn't Parker already hold the heavyweight title? So, in a sport where, you know, the opportunities are limited, who should... Usyk fight next, Wilder or Joe Parker? I would pick Parker over Wilder. Let me also say too, styles matter. You look at Usyk and Usyk's advanced. In this fight, he is relentlessly front foot and relies a bit too much on his straight left. But Usyk's an advanced fighter. Right, great stamina, hard to clinch, you know, comes in at angles. Now, I'm in the United States, and Jared Anderson is getting a lot of press. His team's done a great job putting his name out in the public. But I just don't believe that Jared Anderson is ready for Usyk. I just don't. But there's another young American heavyweight who might be who's a southpaw who ironically is I believe another Bob Arum fighter who has an extensive amateur pedigree who won a silver medal at the Olympics right had a lot of amateur fights has a 100% KO ratio right now is a bit of a goofball, and so he's underrated, right? He could give an interview, you could watch the interview, then they could tell you after the interview, yeah, what do you think of the professional fighter? And you'd say, what, a professional fighter was involved in the interview? When that fighter was the guy being interviewed. I'm talking about Olympic silver medalist, Ricardo Torres. Right, folks, take a hard look at him. This is a southpaw who fights a Mike Tyson type of style, who has hand speed. Right now, understand, he got KO'd in the past in a famous amateur fight where he was fighting a semi-professional Russian fighter who ends up beating him later for the gold medal. Right? It's bad footage. He gets knocked out. You have a group out there that says, oh, he's too small, even though he's 6'2 and bigger than Mike Tyson. Right? Such is the size of heavyweights these days. So just understand, in terms of hand speed and athleticism, you need to think about opponents who can come close to matching Usyk. This young guy might be able to. Right now, he's just starting out professionally. He has something like 10 fights, 11 fights, or something like that. He just beat an unbeaten guy. Right? That was a premium video that I made for members here online. Right? This guy is much better than the guys he's fighting. I believe he's ready for the jump. 
to the world class level, more importantly, style wise, I think he would give Usyk all kinds of problems. Right? Just make a note of the guy's name. Ricardo Torres, he's not on the main stage right now. Right? I'm just telling you, I would take him over people like Jermaine Franklin. I think he gives some of the more highly touted heavyweights problems. Let's talk about a few other ideas here. Now, you heard me mention his name. Zhili Zhang. He's fighting Deontay Wilder. Right? Zhang gave Philippe Ergovic the toughest fight Ergovic has had to date. And understand, I think very highly of Philippe Ergovic. Now, Zhang fought Joe Parker. People need to understand that Joe Parker, like Torres, is one of the best athletes in the heavyweight division. Right? Parker, too, does things that a lot of guys can't do. So, Zhili Zhang is devastating up top. Right? That left up top just obliterated Joe Joyce. Right? Zhang, of course, is a southpaw. In his fight against Zhang, Joe Parker is ducking under the shots. Parker at times is fighting low, lower than a lot of people would. Parker's also taking ridiculous risks. Because he thinks Zhang throws a better high left than a low left, Parker at times is over on Zhang's left side, and he's ducking under the shots. Most of the heavyweight division doesn't have that level of athleticism. Now, my point is simply, Joseph Parker gets knocked down twice by Zhang. He wins the fight. Right? Zhang looks like a non-athlete. Doesn't throw a lot of volume. There are questions, too, about Zhang's stamina. And, of course, the gold standard of stamina is Alexander Usyk. But, folks, that's a tough matchup for Usyk. Right? Understand, you know, I keep wondering why people aren't trying to rough up Usyk off his right shoulder. Jang would try to do just that. I don't think you can be front foot heavy against a guy who is as pinpoint with his dominant hand as Zhang is with his straight left. Right, let's just say because Zhang is a southpaw and he's a slugger, I don't believe that Usyk would be able to fight the fight that he just fought against Fury against Zhang. Right, let me say also, that if Usyk decides he's going to be more back foot against Zhang, to try to leverage his superior athleticism against Zhang, right? I believe he's going to run into problems, right? Because again, Zhang is accurate. It's a bad visual, right? Usyk backing away. I'm not sure if Usyk backing away is as good as Usyk on his front foot. I think Zhili Zhang gives Usyk a tough fight. I don't believe Usyk is unbeatable. Right? He's great. But just like we know Greg Maddox wasn't unbeatable, I don't believe Usyk's unbeatable. I think certain styles hurt him. Luis Ortiz, I know this is controversial. Luis Ortiz, in my eyes, has been one of the best heavyweights for the last eight years. I saw him beating Wilder twice. Of course, knockouts cause amnesia. I'm not saying Luis Ortiz won either fight. He gets stopped in both fights in what I consider to be some of Wilder's best moments. Right? If you're going to criticize Wilder and say he's not a Hall of Famer, explain to all of us how he stops Luis Ortiz twice and how he knocks down Tyson Fury multiple times in multiple fights. 
while beating other quality heavyweights like a Chris Ariola, uh, Robert Hellenius, right? Let's let's give Wilder his due. But let me just say, Ortiz is a smooth southpaw, right? Now I know there's a crowd out there that are gonna say, "Hey, didn't he lose to Andy Ruiz?" Why are we here talking about the loser of that fight instead of Andy Ruiz, right? Didn't you just say that Joe Parker is more deserving than Wilder because he beat Wilder, right? He beat Wilder and Gili Zhang. Let's, let's, let's remember that, right? Well, let me just say, because style-wise, I don't think Andy is competitive with Usyk. Andy, as blessed as he is with hand speed, just doesn't have the foot speed, right? Usyk is the total athlete. If Usyk gets an opportunity to move away from you on demand, I don't think you beat him, right? Keep in mind, Joe Parker, I would argue, didn't know what he was doing against Andy Ruiz. And Joe Parker was able to move away from Ruiz and get a home country decision. Right here you have, you know, a fighter, Usyk, who would know he could circle Andy, right? And who, after looking at the Joshua footage, would understand the last place he wants to be is trading with Andy in the pocket. Now, I believe Luis Ortiz, who Andy beat, knocks him down multiple times. But I believe Luis Ortiz, if he can stay upright, and that's a big question, is the kind of smooth southpaw who could deal with Usyk in transition. I think that match becomes a chess match. Right? I think I think Luis Ortiz would be a tough matchup for Usyk. I think the fact that Ortiz is older might actually make him look more attractive as an opponent for Usyk than some of these other heavyweights. But again, at the end of the Andy Ruiz fight, the fighter who was in better shape was Luis Ortiz, right? Understand, too, you know, Luis Ortiz has been knocked down in fights. But understand who Ortiz is. He gets knocked down twice by Charles Martin, gets off the canvas, and then finishes Charles Martin, right? This is that KG Brazilian vet who I think would make a high-level chess match of a fight against Usyk. Let me, of course, point out, too, Ajit Kabayel. Right, folks? Usyk has problems with body shots. Let me just say the most shocking footage of the weekend, and I mean it was shocking, isn't even from this Fury fight, although I'll give Fury credit early. The first half of this fight is shocking, right? Um, I haven't seen Usyk dismantled like that by anyone else, right? But for me personally, the most shocking footage of this weekend is Caballel against Frank Sanchez, right? Caballel against a mover. Now, something seemed to be wrong with Frank. Right? I'll, I'll, let me be Frank. I Something was wrong with him. Maybe his knee brace hid a knee injury. But understand, Caballel's game plan against a mover <laughs> was to be on his front foot and was to come in throwing power punches. In other words, there's not a lot of difference between what Sonny Liston tried to do against Ali in their first fight and what Caballel is doing against Frank Sanchez. The difference, though, is while Ali is moving away from Liston on his way to taking Liston's title, here, Caballel catches up with Frank Sanchez and roughs him up. Understand, too, this is after Caballel did the same thing against McMudoff. 
So when I see a dedicated body puncher, a guy who gets the timing, right? You know, if you're a dedicated body puncher, you figure out how to throw body shots and not get countered. You figure out the sequencing. You figure out the angles. Caballel has all of that down. Right, folks? Caballel against Usyk, that's a combustible match. Right? I can guarantee you one thing. Usyk would not be able to be as front foot heavy against Caballel as he is here against Fury. Right? You'd be looking at that fight. Understand, too, Caballel's two-handed. He's throwing body punches with both hands. Of course he can throw up top, too, and he's a boxer. With power. Right? I think that's a riveting fight. Right, Caballel's fighting out of Germany. I get the feeling that if they were announced Usyk against Caballel in Germany, you're talking about a sellout. You're talking about a whole group of people who feel that Caballel is underrated and is ready for a shot on the title. I'm going to name two more people. Right, this one's going to sound preposterous. But I'm telling you, the flaws make the diamond. I know Fraser Clark had Fabio Wardley walking into traps. And I give Fraser Clark credit for that. Clark's doing moves where he steps to the side, he takes a step back. Wardley, of course, is front foot heavy. That's his game. Wardley would turn. Wardley would walk right into the trap. Fraser Clark had punches ready for him. Right? Let's just say even in that fight, Wardley drops him. Wardley is a guy with heavy hands, both hands. He's a guy who isn't as structured as, let's say, Usyk is, or most of Usyk's opponents. Folks, it's that unpredictability that makes him dangerous, right? This is the guy who's running red lights. This is the guy who isn't going to sit there, look at Usyk, and be cautious. No, this is the daredevil. This is the risk taker. This is the guy who jumps off bridges or who jumps out of planes with parachutes. Right? I think a Fabio Wardley fight would be huge. Let me say this, and I don't say it lightly, too. If a guy is invading the U.K., and if a guy is taking out some of the UK's best heavyweights, right? Let's look at the body count right now. Joshua, Fury, Dubois, right? Then a fight against another British heavyweight, in my opinion, has to be on British soil. I know Saudi Arabia is putting a lot of currency in a lot of people's pockets. I get it. The fighters are doing well fighting in Saudi Arabia. They've done a great job with the promotion. I myself was into seeing, you know, Ronaldo sitting next to AJ. Right? You know what? Saudi Arabia is doing a great job. But understand, if you're from the UK, and I'm not, but if you're from the UK and you see an invader coming in, taking out guys, Right? You want his next fight to be in the UK against the next man up. I think a Wardley fight, and Wardley, by the way, is an athlete. Right? Maybe he's not a structured boxer, but he is an athlete. Right? He'd be able to follow Usyk around the ring. Right? We saw Derek Chisora have Usyk backed up against the ropes. Make no mistake, you know Wardley has the boldness to try to do exactly that. For the boxing purists, this would be unstructured against structured. Right? I think it would be a hell of a fight. We'd see Usyk's skill level. We'd see Wardley's aggression. 
I imagine there are a lot of boxing fans in the UK right now who's tired of seeing Usyk beating big-time British heavyweights. I think, I think that would be a spectacle. Finally, let me close by talking about a guy who I think might be able to outbox Usyk. I've called him the heir apparent here for years. Don't be, confu don't be confused, don't be intimidated by the Zhili Zhang fight. Understand, Zhang even today is underrated. The styles didn't match up for him in that fight. But make no mistake, Philippe Ergovic is talented. Folks, he's unbeaten. Against Zhang, he had to get off the canvas. He had to deal with Blood pouring down from a cut on his head. He needed to come back in that fight in the last third of the fight. And from this seat, he delivered. Right? You know, we overlook age. And I know someone's going to point out that Ergovic himself's in his 30s. But understand, you know, that's far different than Usyk, who's in his later 30s, right? The angles here, too, are different. Because Ergovic, who has a back foot, can come in the pocket and throw punches with loops, right? I think that would confuse Usyk. If Usyk were to pivot, if Ergovic beats Daniel Dubois, and we're already hearing that they sparred in the past privately and Usyk, excuse me, Ergovic got the better of Dubois, right? We've already heard those rumors. There's a clip here on YouTube of Ergovic sparring with Deontay Wilder and folks, he's clubbing Deontay Wilder all over the place. I believe Ergovic, one of the stories of the heavyweight division is going to be Philippe Ergovic, who really has been one of the division's most avoided fighters, finally getting an opportunity to fight A-level competition, right? Pay close attention to what happens in this Ergovic-Dubois fight, right? Just understand, I believe Ergovic today would give Usyk all he can handle. So, just understand, the heavyweight division is deep. I've never seen it this deep. You're going to have a lot of fallout whether or not there is a rematch between Usyk and Fury. Just understand, you have a list of guys who would give Usyk all he can handle, right? I'm a bit shocked that Usyk wants to fight until he's 40, right? That surprises me. If he follows through on that promise, I believe he's necessarily going to have to fight Philip Ergovic sometime in the next two years. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. If you feel I've overlooked some fighters, I think Martin Bacoli would be an excellent opponent. Although I question Bacoli's stamina, right? I believe that fight might be like this Fury fight where Bacoli comes out after six rounds, you're thinking, oh man, is this going to be a, you know, a Bacoli win? Is this going to be a win by Usyk's opponent? And then Bacoli might just drop from exhaustion, right? Because let's face it, he wouldn't be fighting Tony Yoka. Right? Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of the heavyweight division. Folks, life's unfair. You have a deep heavyweight division. You have a champ who is historical. Right? Olympic gold medal. Undisputed at cruiser. Now undisputed at heavy. You know, in fact, he might have already been stripped of one of the belts at heavy. But let's just say... He's the first undisputed heavyweight champion in more than two decades. Right, folks? 
let's just say the division is loaded with competition, and I'm not just talking about Tyson Fury. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.